it, it's not as important when they're not serving a member, for instance, um, especially in our training classes, instead of going two hours and then <laughs> taking a break, we're taking actually tech breaks about every 45 minutes to an hour. So they're shorter breaks, but you can pull out your cell phone now and look at that and then trying to keep the distraction away. So the re-examining those policies and not just having a, a no policy that's not working, kind of taking a tip from the public schools at this point. Aurora? Just uh, like mentioned before, you know, the knowledge, having knowledge, especially your managers, the ones dealing with the employees, um, them knowing uh, the, difference, the difference in the gen, uh, generations and what helps. It just helps build um, their ability to be able to have better conversations. So uh, and increasing the chances of them being um, heard by the employees and understood better because uh, if they show the understanding of the other person's perspective. It's just uh, that's pretty much helps reduce the tension in the conversation and have, be able to have them listen to you and have them engaged. So that's all I have to say. Well, Robin, time's up, so I'll make it s just short and sweet. Um, <clears throat> learn how to communicate with the different levels in your workplace. Um, make sure that you recognize your employees, and it can be something, you don't have to give them money, because I found that some of the younger employees that are city, uh, in, like in our city or even in the military are not motivated by money. They're motivated more by being part of a team, being part of the solution, uh, being dedicated to their job. So, I mean, just sometimes just in a work meeting or a briefing, recognize their, just something as simple as recognize and act in front of their peers. Um, but it's real simple. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Well, and so just to wrap up here, people are different. And with the generations, we have generalizations. It gets the conversation started. Continue the conversation. The basic life principle is this. And aren't you lucky that you're here to hear it? This is it. So if you're on your phones, put them down. This is it. Give people what they need, and they will give you what you need. So get the conversation started, find out what they need from you. And finally, everybody wants to be a part of the workforce. Everybody has something to offer. Let them and benefit from that. Thank you. Well, that was a great presentation. I appreciate that, Robin, very much. Suddenly, I feel very old. I don't know why that is. Um, it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Horace Mitchell. He's the president of California State University, Bakersfield. Appointed in 2004, he has led CSUB to national recognition with a vision to extend the excellence and diversity of faculty and academic programs, enhance the quality of the student experience, and strengthen the university's community engagement. And uh, as you've seen in recent sports news, he has been at the forefront of leading uh, California State University Bakersfield to Division I and the runners to their uh, first ever playoffs in March Madness. Yeah. So. With that spirit of go runners, I want you to show your appreciation to the California State University Bakersfield Road Runners and to Dr. Horace Mitchell as he comes to the podium. Dr. Mitchell. Thank you, Jeff, and good morning, everyone. In fact, it has been my privilege and honor to serve our community as president at CSU Bakersfield over the past 12 years. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next panel, which will be on uh, local economic conditions and trends. And I'm going to ask them to go ahead and join me on the stage here. And I would add, while they're coming up, that over the last year, CSU Bakersfield has received quite a number of national accolades. And one that I will mention relative to this meeting this morning is that we were ranked by 
economist as the number five university in the country in terms of the value of the degree in terms of economics as, as measured by mid-career earnings of graduates. We thought that was pretty good. Thank you. So this next panel uh, consists of three economists from CSUB. And I'll give brief introductions, and of course the full introductions are in your program. First of all, uh, Dr. Mark Evans is professor and chair of the Department of Economics in the School of Business and Public Administration at CSUB. Previously, he served as associate dean of the school and also as interim dean, and he was also interim dean of our uh, extended university division. He received his PhD from the University of New Mexico and joined the CSUB faculty in 1978. The university was only uh, eight years old when he joined the university. Second, uh, Dr. Nakundi Micheka, I had to struggle with that a little bit, <laughs> is Assistant Professor of Economics. Uh, he grew up in Kenya where he earned his undergraduate degree and he earned his PhD in Natural Resources and e Environmental Economics from the University of West Virginia. He came to CSUB in September 2014. Third is Dr. Richard Gearhart. He is also Assistant Professor of Economics. He joined the faculty in August of 2014, coming from Clemson University, where he earned his master's degree and PhD in economics. He's also the managing editor of the Kern Economic Journal. I'm going to turn the panel over to Dr. Evans. Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to point out that uh, starting on page five of your printed program, we've compiled some, uh, updated some indicators that we uh, hope is useful to you and, and maybe has some shelf value if you're sitting somewhere a few months from now and wondering what the, exactly what the population is or the GDP or, or whatever. So uh, let us know if um, uh, what indicators would be of most interest to you if it's not these. And uh, next year we'll, we'll adapt. Uh, Nakundi, could we start out by, uh, we, we don't have time to cover everything that's, that's in the printed program, but what's the big picture in terms of how population's been changing in Kern County and how uh, GDP's been changing. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Evans, and thank you, Dr. Mitchell, for the wonderful introduction. So what I plan to do, uh, just to answer your question, is I'm going to present two slides. And the first slide will talk about how Kern County's population has been changing between 1981 and 2005. And then the next slide will have a uh, you know, a, a graph of how GDP has been changing. So if we were to look at population between 1981 and 2015, uh, here we're talking about, you know, right around the age where the baby, well, no, actually the millennials were being born. So around that time, uh, you can see the blue line is the population of Kern County, and then we have a red line which shows the population of California. So the one thing that you might notice is during that span of 35 years, Kern County's population actually doubled from about 400,000 to around 874,000, which is where we are today. Uh, during that time, uh, California's population did not grow as fast. And one other thing you'll notice from that graph is that between 2000 and 2010, which is the last decade, Kern County's population was growing twice the speed of California. So we were growing much faster, but that speed actually reduced towards, you know, over the last couple of years. And just to put numbers, uh, between 2014 and 2015, Kern County's population grew at 0.65%, and California's population grew at about 0.93%. Uh, so we're kind of slowing down and catching up with that. So we had 874,000 uh, 
population for Kern County. And this is a number which is very similar. If you were to think of similar sized populations or counties which have similar sizes as Kern County, you'd find that San Francisco and Ventura were pretty much the same size with uh, San Francisco and Ventura. And uh, New Haven and, and Hartford in Connecticut. In terms of countries, if Kern County was to be a country, you'd think of it as Fiji, Comoros, or Guyana. Uh, California has a population of 38.7 million, which is a similar size population as, as Kenya. So that's, uh, that's where we are in terms of, of population. What about GDP growth? So on the x-axis, we have time. On the y-axis, we have GDP in billions. And, 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 and we'll do the same thing. We'll look at how Kern County's population is growing in terms of GDP. And we'll do the same with California and see how that's happening. So the one thing you'll notice is that Kern County's GDP has been growing at a much faster rate than that of California. You can notice that before. So the blue line, again, is for Kern County. And there's a dip which we see, um, which happened during the time of the recession, which pretty much says that Kern County took you know, a much harder hit than California in, 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 you know, during the recession period. But then we again increased our growth, and we were growing faster than, than California. And this happened up until the last few years. So just to put numbers again into perspective, uh, you have GDP growth over the last five years. Bakersfield has been growing much faster than California and USA. We've been growing at 5% on average over those five years, over you know, the last five years. But the growth has actually slowed down over the last uh, one year. Great. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Nakunda, you've been exploring the relationship between uh, oil prices and uh, employment in the county during periods when there were rapid price increases and rapid price decreases. Uh, what, what, what are, what's it look like? Okay, thanks. So, if you want to, so what we've done is, uh, I'll just give you some a graph here. And so we've talked about GDP, and you can look at GDP. You can you can look at the whole of Kern County, or you can look at different sectors. You can look at the mining sector, you can look at the construction sector, or farm sector. And what we did is. If you were to look at a particular period where oil prices were going up for about a year and then stop at that point and look at the next 12 months after that period and see how growth is taking place in these sectors, you'll find that the mining sector and the construction sector are quite sensitive in terms of GDP, are quite sensitive to changes in oil prices. So, you know, when we had uh, prolonged oil price increases, the period that followed that, we found that uh, mining and the construction industry were quite sensitive. But the ag, forestry, fishing, and hunting sector and the manufacturing sector were not as sensitive to oil price changes as, as, as the mining and the construction. So then there was a study that was put out there. And what these, folk, uh, what these folks did is they said, if oil prices were to decrease by 50%, what do you think we would see in terms of employment at the state level in the United States? So let's look at all the states in the US and say, if oil prices were to decrease by 50%, where do we see a big change in employment? So that uh, shows the map of the US, and the red signifies uh, states where we'd see a large impact in terms of employment. And you'll see that Wyoming gets hit uh, with a 4.3% reduction, uh, reduction in employment. You also have North Dakota, which has a 2% decrease in, in employment, uh, North, uh, Oklahoma, and then you have the Texas, the West Virginias, and the Louisianas. So this is what's happening at the state level. And what we said is, why don't we look at what's happening at the county level? Because that's where, um, you know, Kern County plays, <coughs> plays a role. Now, if I was to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, a question, how many people do you think are employed in Kern County's uh, oil and mining sector? Just average. Anyone can answer this question. <laughs> Pardon? 15, someone said 15,000? 15, 8, right? We're around, the, we're around there. So what we did is, so what, we, the, 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 what I'll do now is I'll show, you a, I'll show you a slide or I'll show you a pie chart which shows the percentage of employees by sector, okay? So um, in June 2014, you'll find that the oil and gas extraction in the well drilling sector employed 3.55% of the total employees in Kern County. So we're looking at about 12,000 individuals, which is about, yeah. 2,000 people more than the ones we have at CSU Bakersfield. If you were to look at uh, the other sector, construction employed about 5% of the total employees in, in Kern County. The manufacturing sector had about 4%. And then the service sector, which is the yellow one, 
employed about 60% of the employees. We're talking about 209,000 people here. The service sector employs a lot of people. And then the other, the blue is the other industries, which are the, the, the farming. So we said, okay, let's look at a snapshot of what's happening June, in June 2014, and let's look at a snapshot of what's happening in January 2016, about 18 months after the oil prices have actually gone down. Let's see, do we see more people working in the oil industry or farm, eh, what's happening? Okay, let's do the same thing. So we find that, again, the oil and gas and extraction drilling our employees reduced. We also saw a reduction in the number of employees in the construction industry, a reduction in the number of employees working in manufacturing, but then the service sector increased, okay? We see an increase in, you know, about 3% from June 2014 to January 2016. So during this period, we're actually seeing more people working in the service industry compared to what we saw a couple of years ago. So while we see some gains, or while we see some losses taking place in one part, we see some gains happening in another sector. With service sector, what we're talking about is, we're talking about retail, we're talking about restaurants, we're talking about transportation. You know, when oil prices go down, uh, consumers are left with more disposable income to spend on shopping. We buy food, we go for rest, we, we, we now upgrade, we go to, you know, we stop going to Applebee's and maybe go to our better restaurants, right? And, and buy better clothes, maybe if these are normal goods. So those, those sectors, we've seen an increase in, in the number. And then the other, you know, the other sectors, which includes farming, has, has also reduced. So we've seen a growth in, in the service providing industry. Now, if you were to look at employment in June 2014 and January 2016, and you are to compare, you'll find that in June 2014, we had Kern County employed about 351,000 people, but this number increased. Uh, to 353,100. So um, the number of people employed has actually increased during this period, right? So that's something, that's a plus to think about. So then we said, okay, well, uh, let's, let's do something else. Let's look at how employment is changing, right? Uh, over the last 25 years, ooh, which is pretty awesome, right? Uh, 25 years, and let's say, well, on average, what usually happens, you know, we, let's look at periods where we had oil price increases and oil price decreases, and then let's look at the 12 months following that period and see what's actually happening to employment. Do we see employment growth? Do we see employment declining? And let's do that with each sector. Let's, do, you know, let's look at the top five sectors. So you have a blue line here that is going to take its time to go from one side to the other, which shows uh, the number of employees in, in, in construction, and then you have, those are the farming employees. I have another graph here showing, you know, you can see that uh, that's manufacturing slowly making its way. And as, as after, after we do that, and, the, and then the black line shows uh, the West Texas intermediate uh, spot prices. So we said, let's look at what's happening every 12 months, you know, during the last 25 years and see what's happening. So in general, over the last 25 years, these are just looking at averages. We're not looking at, we're not doing any models here. On average, the oil and gas employment sector, you know, it's very responsive to changes in oil prices, okay. Construction, again, is responsive to changes in oil prices. Manufacturing sector, eh, it continues to grow despite changes in oil prices. So it's a bit immune, but the one that is quite immune is the service sector, which is not very responsive. So if you're to look at the, you know, the 12 months following an in, a period of increased oil uh, prices going up or prices going down, you'll find that those 12 months um, for the service sector, not very responsive. It kind of does its own, its, its own thing. So we then decided that we're going to um, look at, you know, let's look at numbers. Let's look at numbers in June 2014 and in January 2016, and let's see what, uh, what changes we see. The number of employees in oil and gas extraction and well drilling declined by 20%. That's quite a number, but here we're talking about a change from 9,000 people, I mean from 12,000 people to 9,000. So, those are, you know, we're talking about 3,000 individuals here. Construction has also gone down. Manufacturing has gone down. Service, hmm, we're talking about 210, 220,000 individuals here. This number has actually gone up. And total employment over that period has actually increased. So we're seeing gains again and losses. We're seeing things happening on, on, on both sides. So on, then we, we, we ran a paper, there's a study that Dr. Gearhart and I worked on and we published it and, you know, what we said is let's look at how oil prices, you know, oil prices have their own path and you have employment having its own path. Let's see how these paths move, whether changes in oil prices affect employment and whether these changes take place in the long run or in the short run. So 
We found that uh, West Texas Intermediate and the oil and gas and farm sectors, they move together, right, in the long run, but not in the short run. Meaning changes that take place in oil prices in the short run don't really affect farming employment, you know, over the short run. It takes a while before you start to see those effects coming into play. Uh, as for manufacturing, construction, and service sectors, yeah, West Texas Intermediate does not really influence em employment. So that was the study. And then just um, to, to, to cap this, uh, we looked at renewables. and. Studies have been put out there and they say that actually the price of, the spot price of natural gas has reduced, you know, they, got, they moved together with oil prices, but it's actually at its lowest period right now, uh, which is really low. So oil uh, prices of natural gas have also decre uh, decreased, and this is due to the increase in, 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 in production or increase in supply of natural gas, uh, primarily coming from Marcella's shale. What about renewables? Many of us would think, well, if oil prices went down, would we see an increase in renewable energy? Would we see people you know, adopting more renewable energy technologies because oil prices are low? Well, we did the same thing and we, we looked at this. Now this graph is not as clear, but you may be able to see it in, 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 in the printed material, but natural gas, total renewable energy has actually decreased during this period, but investment in renewables has been quite high uh, as, as, as reports have found. So we're seeing changes here and there, but at the end, this is uh, what, what, what we're getting to. So what do we take away? Now, since the turn of the decade, uh, Kern County's population has slowed down. It was growing quite fast, but it has slowed down to roughly the same rate as California. That's population. In terms of GDP, we were moving quite fast. We were growing, but it has also um, slowed down to, to, to Kern County's level, I mean, to California's level. And then while some sectors lost jobs when the oil prices declined, there, were, there was a modest increase in employment in, uh, in, in, in Kern County. And then oil prices affect employment, but the effect is not immediate. So those are some of the takeaways. I hope you at least take one of these home, maybe two or three or all of them. It will be really nice if you take all of them. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Gerhardt, who is a health economist at California State at CSUB. And uh, Dr. Gerhardt, the Affordable Care Act is a game changer, and it's gobbling more and more GDP. So what changes are we noticing in Kern County's health industry? And is healthcare more affordable? Are people, would you have more people being covered and how is that affecting jobs? So to save a little bit of time, I'm gonna skip the first slide. It's not as important. If we look at the percent of children who are uninsured, we've decreased from about one in 11 children not being uninsured to much less. So children are a low cost population that we can treat effectively it's good to get children insured. If we look at the total number of Medi-Cal beneficiaries since 2009, there's been about 150,000 number increase in total Medi-Cal beneficiaries. So that's a huge increase. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is these individuals are either not utilizing care just because of the long wait times to see their family doctors, or in the second column, they're using the emergency department as their primary source of care. So among Medi-Cal patients, there's been a nearly 10% increase in the number of visits by Medi-Cal patients. That's not good. Unfortunately, even though the number of providers, both in hospitals and nurses, has increased in Kern County, since 2009, there's been a nearly 50% increase in the number of nurses, which is more than total employment, so that's really good it still isn't keeping pace with the total number of Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And so I wanna talk a little bit about healthcare efficiency. And we often hear that Kern County is one of the poorest providers of healthcare. And what we hear is that the healthcare inputs, the providers, the doctors, the nurses, the hospitals, the equipment that we utilize, those are the only things that are used to impact individual health. And that's incorrect. There are a lot of other factors that influence population health. They're demographic, the race, gender, your age. They're environmental, your access to clean water, your access to healthy foods, the air quality. Behavioral is huge, smoking, drinking, those monster energy drinks that fall out of trucks whenever someone steps in. Economic, unemployment, household income. And so the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation creates county health rankings, and they say that Kern County is near dead last in producing health care. And we've done a study and said, is Kern County health care that bad? And the answer is no. 
Look at all these factors. Behavioral, we're more likely to smoke, less likely to go to college, less likely to exercise, more likely to have children in poverty, have unclean water, and we have fewer medical providers than California as a whole. Well, if we take a look at the difference in these inputs and some certain health outcomes between us and California, notice the red. We have significantly worse health inputs than health outputs. Or our medical providers are fighting an uphill battle from the moment that they see a patient. Basically, healthcare inputs are all significantly much worse in Kern County than in California on average. Healthcare providers are doing a fantastic job providing care that offsets many of these disadvantages that they face. Again, they're fighting an uphill battle. Dr. Macheka and I did a study on this, and we found that Kern County ranks middle of the pack, much better than what previous analyses have found. And we still ask ourselves, is that still low? And the answer is no. Most of the impact of having low health outcomes is behavioral in Kern County. It's the smoking, not exercising, the drinking, eating the fast food. So even though medical providers might be able to provide treatment, health behaviors can offset a lot of the good that our health care can do. Uh, talk very, very briefly on how would a hypothetical minimum wage increase of $15 impact Kern County. And I, I, I noticed in the paper this morning that that will be on the ballot in November. So, very hypothetical. So, we look in the first column, <laughs> about 40% of the workforce in Kern County earns less than $15 an hour. Pretty much all cashiers, retail salesmen, fast food and restaurant cooks, servers, and farm workers would be impacted. Or essentially, we estimate that 120,000 people in Kern County of the nearly 300,000 would have to have their wages raised. This doesn't take into account the fact that other workers will have their wages raised just because they feel like they need to and it's mostly driven by the farm sector. One point to make, and it's very important, is that a federal minimum wage is probably not the best tool to combat poverty. A $15 per hour minimum wage feels like $15.35 in Bakersfield and $12.47 in San Francisco. Our dollar goes a lot further than a lot of other places, signifying that perhaps we should look at county level initiatives if we want to impact poverty. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Mark Evans. Thank you, Richard. Is this one working? Yeah. Okay. Okay, the United States uh, needs approximately $1.7 trillion of infrastructure by the end of the decade. Uh, now, in a country like Germany or Canada, which is just as committed to environmental quality as the United States, it would take about two years to get one of these projects off the ground. Uh, here in the United States, it takes eight to 10 years uh, to get really the permitting approvals. Uh, it's not that Germany is less committed to the environment, it's just that they know how to make a decision. Um, now, uh, a nonpartisan reform group called Common Good uh, uh, published a study in September that tried to estimate that the cost, in addition to this 1.7 just current capital costs, what are the costs of delaying these projects or this portfolio of projects uh, from let's say a two-year approval rate to an eight and uh, they found that it would cost actually 3.6 trillion dollars extra in foregone benefits and increased project costs just because of stringing out this process that's in addition to the 1.7 trillion uh, just because of the delays themselves uh, let, I'm gonna skip uh, this chart in the interest of uh, moving on. 
Uh, but there have been several uh, efforts to reform the process, and most of the suggestions focus around four things. Uh, one is we need to consolidate authority and, and make, uh, make somebody politically accountable. And what that means is that decisions have to be made in terms of scope of environmental review, permitting, take them out of the ju judiciary sector and put it somewhere where someone's politically accountable. Uh, secondly, the, the, the role of public comment needs to be transformed from blocking and delaying to informing whoever has the, the political accountability. Uh, third, um, we need to remove the fact that an EIR may be imperfect as a grounds for litigation because things can always be made a little bit better if you're just willing to spend enough money. And then uh, finally, we need specific timelines. Now, uh, please skip this slide too, Richard. Um, the, the slide I just skipped tried to lay, uh, indicate that the really Kern County laid the foundation for attacking a lot of these things that need to be uh, reformed nationwide starting with uh, wind energy in 1986. But let's fast forward to the present where we recently uh, changed our process for um, uh, oil permitting. And basically what's happened here is the county really is now involved for the first time in terms of oil permitting. And uh, what they've done is they've structured this permitting in a way that it's, it's uh, completely what's called ministerial, which means that it involves a, a simply a checkoff regarding whether certain standards have been met. And the standards that have to be met are in the EIR that the county put together, and that EIR is structured to where its standards are substantive enough to constitute an adequate environmental document under CEQA. So that has big implications because if it stands, uh, there's, there's sort of a once and for all uh, look at whether the, whether the EIR is appropriate and then if it is, it applies to oil development throughout the county. Now from the perspective of these reform goals I mentioned, in terms of timelines, uh, what we've done is we've incentivized negotiating agreements between surface rights holders and, and mineral rights holders. Uh, this should lead to less litigation and we've also incentivized it by accelerating permit review timelines if you can come up with a negotiated agreement. Uh, in terms of uh, reforming the EIR process, you really can't do anything about that at the local level, but it's kind of creative in that what our county's trying to do is structure that uh, so there, there will be one EIR challenge rather than an EIR challenge. It's kind of like a meta challenge that we've got to get through. But if that succeeds, then, the, then the, really the procedure is in place to uh, basically you've done the review for everything that's going to happen after that rather than having to have a challenge each one individually. Uh, and then in terms of rationalizing the authority lines, again, we can't do anything about federal law at the national level, but we have put together a process that's streamlined, coordinated, that's really a roadmap that other, all other state agencies can do in terms of performing their responsibility in the permitting process. So uh, quite entrepreneurial in my opinion. Now, um, the reason I'm talking about uh, physical infrastructure and private investment as well as education is those really are the two ingredients of, of future growth. So, uh, you know, I think in terms of, of uh, capital formation, as long as we have the stewardship or we, that's required to fund these projects, the county is in a really good position in terms of making sure they happen. With regard to human capital, as President Mitchell mentioned, we now are able to actually figure out what individual colleges are doing in terms of uh, either adding uh, value in the workplace of their graduates or not adding value. Uh, there have been two uh, very good studies by very reputable 
organizations recently, and I'd like to summarize them. First, the Brookings Institution uh, did an evaluation of two-year colleges and four-year colleges, and uh, what they came up with uh, in terms of uh, estimate for Bakersfield College is that Bakersfield College, uh, really mid-career, adds 4,000 more in earnings to its graduates than similar graduates graduating from similar colleges in similar regions. This puts BC in the 85th percentile in terms of two-year colleges, so this is really a phenomenal result. Taft College, but uh, 10 years out, a graduate of Taft College is making almost $7,000 a year more than, than a graduate with the same uh, personal characteristics uh, graduating from a similar college in a similar region. This puts Taft in the 96th percentile in terms of two-year colleges. CSUB, um, the earnings of our typical grad 10 years down the road are almost $12,000 more than graduates of similar colleges that have similar abilities to our students graduating in regions with similar uh, labor markets. Uh, that was the 95th percentile in terms of four-year colleges. Second big study was by The Economist uh, magazine. And um, uh, The Economist looked only at four-year colleges. And what it found is, uh, uh, this is uh, reassuring, but their estimates were quite close to the Brookings institutions, which suggests that the studies are, are reliable and that they're coming up with similar estimates. But again, about $11,000 uh, additional earnings over students with the same ability graduating from universities with the same general characteristics. This put us at number 10 in the nation in terms of increase and value added, 99th percentile. <laughs> Dr. Mitchell told me he's uh, looking forward to another top 10 rating here. Uh, one or two marches down the road. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, you know, final reflection. I think our county is really well positioned. Uh, I think what we've done is, uh, in terms of the things we can locally can control, we're ready to move forward when oil prices stabilize. Our permitting policies uh, really allow both companies and government to, to create a decent rate of return by allowing them to uh, implement projects on a timely basis. We saw on the earlier slide that this can make a huge difference in terms of cost and rate of return. Uh, yet the way we've structured this <coughs> permitting process, we buy the timeliness by really requiring the state of the art environmental protection. Uh, so I, I don't think most people realize that from reading the people that show up at a lot of the public hearings. And then in terms of our universities, they now are really recognized by some very reputable national and international organizations as among the best in the world, or best in the country, I should say. And that's it. Thank you. Mark and panelists, thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation today. Just a reminder, uh, please work on your um, evaluation forms. Coming up, we'll hear from the city of Riverside and our keynote speaker, but we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So refreshments are in the foyer and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thank you very much.
rest of the program. The city of Riverside ranks number one in the nation for growth of the millennial population, according to a recent Pew Research Institute study. We are privileged today to welcome Emilio Ramirez, Deputy Director for the City of Riverside's Community and Economic Development Department. He's going to share what his city is doing to attract and retain this important segment of Riverside's workforce. He has served the City of Riverside since 2011 after 15 years with the Redevelopment Agency and affordable housing experience with the County of Riverside. Emilio received undergraduate degrees from the University of California, Riverside, a graduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona, and a degree of law from Whittier Law School. So please help me in welcoming Emilio Ramirez. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Emilio Ramirez, as you just heard. I have the distinct privilege of serving the city of Riverside as their director of development and also director of its successor agency and deputy director for community economic development. Um, very, very honored and privileged to, that you have invited me to join you from the Inland Empire to the Golden Empire. It's really cool. Um, I've been asked to share a little bit about uh, the city of Riverside and what we are doing uh, to progress and to develop and to try to attract and retain the younger generation as well as uh, maintaining all generations that live in Riverside. I have been doing a little bit of research on the area here in Kern County in Bakersfield trying to get ready for this. Admittedly, I haven't really stopped in Bakersfield. I grew up in a little area of Marysville, north of Sacramento, and I moved to Riverside, and I'd driven by here, I don't know how many times, and yet haven't really stopped. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research. Uh, I discovered that we're a lot alike, uh, and that's probably why uh, number one and number two ranking, um, and I'm not about to try to show you or teach you anything that we've done that I'm sure you guys have already figured out. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about the City of Arts and Innovation, which is what the City of Riverside um, likes to um, believe that it is. I think that we are. Um, and I think that that uh, leads to why there has been some, some success in what we're talking about today. Um, I can tell you that we had embarked upon a mission in early 2000 um, to invest about a billion and a half dollars in the infrastructure in Riverside, calling it the Riverside Renaissance. And it would be disingenuous of me to tell you that we knew that in 2016 it was going to create a center of millennials in, in downtown Riverside or in Riverside as a whole. But um, we got lucky and we're very, very happy about that. I can tell you also that um, from my research, um, it, it appears as though uh, millennials are people too, so that's cool. Um, and we, we've learned uh, along the way uh, in the United States that change is constant, change is always, and generation from generation, we always have to uh, try to adhere to what the new generation is, and millennials happen to be the new generation and taking up a significant part of the population, both in Riverside and in Bakersfield. And I think a lot like what is in Riverside, um, millennials, like everything else, they're, they're homegrown. And uh, a lot in Bakersfield as well. I'm going to go through a little bit of what we are doing in Riverside, and I think that you're going to see a lot of similarities in what you're doing here um, and what you're undertaking. Um, I do think that there is, I'm jealous about a couple things that you guys are working on. Your Bakersfield, your Make Bakersfield Downtown Project, I think that's so hot. Um, I wish we could take it, I'm probably going to steal it. Um, so let me show you a little bit about what Riverside is doing. It's quick, I, I assure you. Um, first a video. Maybe no video. <laughs> 